don't know if you remember, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned John 6, 66, an aptly numbered verse and chapter for what was taking place in that verse. When Jesus had given, arguably in chapter 6, his toughest sermon anywhere in Scripture, culminating in something like this, unless you eat my flesh, you have no life in you. And the word eat there in John's Gospel carries the idea of chomping, of gnawing, of chewing. Not just eating a morsel of bread as we do in our communion services, but gnawing on the flesh. It was an abominable idea to first century Jews. Of course it was. A very hard teaching. Some disciples in John's Gospel said, who on earth can take this difficult teaching? Others in John 6, 66 said, we've had enough of this, we're off. This is way too difficult for us. We're getting out of here. The text says they turned away and no longer follows. That's why Jesus says, no one can come to me unless it's granted by my Father. No one can come to the Father unless the Father says so. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, Keep your Bibles open on Luke chapter 4 as we integrate these two things. Luke chapter 4 in what is called the Nazareth Manifesto. This is the solution to the sin problem of the entire world in this chapter. It's quoted from Isaiah 61, as I said. And is a, Isaiah 61 is a majestic passage on messianic hope. The longing. The longing for this long-awaited Messiah. Where is He? When will He come? How will we know? What will He do? Luke 4.19 is quoted from Isaiah 61. And at the end of Isaiah 61 quote in Luke, it says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you see that? That's referring to Leviticus 25.10 where the passage in Leviticus is talking about the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, this is the idea of, of what the Mosaic law was trying to convey. Every 50 years, slaves are set free, land is returned to its original owners, debt is cancelled, everything is reset. It's an astonishing vision. And there isn't anywhere in the Old Testament there isn't a shred of evidence that suggests that this majestic idea was even carried out. Such is the ravishing generosity of what God is saying of how his people are to live. It's quite something. It just clearly demonstrates God's beating heart from Leviticus all the way through to what is called Second Isaiah in the exile period. Right through, spanning almost the entire period of uh, the Old Testament period. We see God's beating heart. And now Jesus has the audacity to come into his hometown synagogue, pick up the Isaiah scroll or have it handed to him after returning just before, if you look through the early part of chapter 4, from the wilderness temptations. I'm always very fondly remembering uh, you guys when I talk about the wilderness temptations in a good way, not in a bad way. Because that's when I first met you, when I, when I was with you for the church weekend away a few years ago. So Jesus is lean, he's wiry, sinewy, he hasn't eaten much for a long time, his skin will be burnt and leathery and tanned, and he has the audacity to say all that longing, all that hope for Israel is united in me, it's uniting in me. This text, your ancestral longing, is now united in me. It is astonishing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because it's anointed. He has anointed me. Jesus is claiming the me here. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He set me, sent me to set the, those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's astonishing. My calling to Egypt when we were with YWAM um, as missionaries came less than 
well, we, we, we ended up in Egypt less than four years after 9-11. God had to speak into that situation to send me as a young-ish Christian and my young family into the turmoil of the Middle East just after 9-11 uh, with all the polit- geopolitical stuff that was going on. Uh, just before the Arab Spring, things were fermenting underneath the society's uh, skin, as it were. I had to have my spirit of the Lord is on me moment in order to go. I had to hear God's voice. And many of us will have moments in our life when we must hear God speak. We don't just go willy-nilly. We don't just take it lightly. God must speak and the spirit of the Lord must be upon me. It must be upon us. It was a profound experience. Why must the Spirit of the Lord be upon us? To continue that gospel work of jubilee, the gospel work of redemption, the gospel work of salvation and proclamation. To reach into the sin-weary world as Jesus reached into this sin-weary world where we hear Jesus say, yes, I know the teaching is tough. Yes, I know the road is narrow. Yes, I know the laborers are few. Yes, I know many of your friends will leave you. They left me. But will you follow me? Will you follow me? And I know that almost, I would say everybody here is Christian. Taking a rough guess on a Sunday morning in church. But you need to make that decision again today. Will you follow Jesus? Remember the clip in in The Chosen? Jesus says by by the shore to Peter, will you follow me? Peter is having his brain racked and turned inside out and back to front as he tries to work out something about that guy that's compelling me. He's compelled into the life of Christ. And it's good news for him. And it's good news for everyone. So this gospel vision is the engine of all that we do in the world. We must proclaim good news to the poor. We must proclaim liberty to the captives. We must proclaim freedom for the oppressed and recovery of sight for the blind. Not just physical You could be the richest person in the world and the most oppressed and blind. You could be an optician with perfect 2020 vision. We don't want to remember this year, do we? 2020. (laughs) You could be an optician who fixes people's eyes but be the most blind person on the planet because you don't see what God is doing. So the gospel comes to us and just peels back the layers all the time, helping us to see, setting us free. Releasing the oppressed. It's brilliant news. And we can only do this, the gospel way, in the Christ way, by the Spirit of the Lord being upon us. We need Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need to be fully alive in the Spirit of God, fully committed to His work. Declaring with all boldness, despite the church losing its cultural voice, and the church has lost its cultural voice in the Western world largely, the wheels of culture will turn, by the way. What is required of us is not a hiding away or a battening down or a hiding or anything like this. It is faithfulness in the basics. Prayer, Scripture, meeting together, breaking bread the basics we do what we do because that's what we do because that's what we do because we still have a gospel to proclaim and to live out in the world what does the world need evangelical christians christians that carry the evangel the gospel it doesn't need evangelifish christians evangelical Christians, people who've met the risen Christ, whose spine has been fortified and strengthened, whose knobbly knees are no longer knocking. I was worried I wasn't going to get those words out. Whose knobbly knees no longer knock, 
at the task that is before them. Because we have a gospel that does confront the evils of our day. It does draw lines in the sand. It does say, no more. That's the point at which we are compelled or repelled. Consider what's going on in our world now. Race riots in major cities, especially in America, fueled by woke, neo-Marxist ideologies. Global terrorism, fueled by Islamic jihad ideologies. We remember this teacher on Friday at 3 o'clock our time, beheaded on the streets of Paris. Sick and disgusting and wicked. And we must call it out, mustn't we, church? We must pray that it ends. What do we pray for? The redemption of Islam. No longer to be functioning as a, as a Christian heresy, but to be functioning as Christian. We pray for the entire overhaul of the Islamic worldview. Because it's anti-Christ. The gospel confronts global poverty fueled by human greed. What about people trafficking? What's that fueled by? Money, sex, power. The big three. One of them will get us. <laughs> Remember my principal saying uh, in my last few days at uh, college, just before I was um, sent out to, Tor to Torquay in my first pastorate, all the, all the final year students were in his office, and he said, you've heard it all now, you've read all the books, you've, you've been formed, you've been, you, you've been mentored, you've had lots and lots of input, but I want you to pay attention, there are three things that are going to get you, he said. And he's talking explicitly about ministry, but this is true, I think, in general, in any case. There are three things that will get you. The lust for money, the lust for sex, and the lust for power. Something will happen there in those three. So that's sex trafficking, people trafficking, men, women, and children. God forbid, what a wicked thing. The gospel says no to that. Unashamedly, no. Between March and September this year of our, of our lockdown, there were on average, on average, despite the bell curve of COVID, uh, averaged out now 197 deaths per day of COVID from the government website here. Yet, on average, in the same period of time, there were 550 abortions per day. It's wicked. Five hundred and fifty abortions in the UK alone. That's nearly three times as many. That's fifty six million aborted babies every year around the world. Fifty six million. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Something's very wrong. We know it. Does the gospel of Jesus Christ have anything to say about this? Yes. Yes, it does. This is not a world for evangelifish followers of Jesus. But a world that needs to be met by women and men who can say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because it must be God that anoints for us to be able to proclaim and set free and give sight. Because as we prayed earlier, the gospel of raw reconciliation, raw redemption, raw rescue is the solution to our world, church. Why? Because there's one creator, God our Father. There's one race that's human. There's one blood, red. There's one problem, sin. And there's one solution. What's his name, church? Jesus Christ. So the gospel goes out in power through those with the weight of the Spirit upon them. When Jesus sat down and waited for the response, notice what happens next. The gospel really is drawing people in and repelling others out. 
chapter 4, 22 says, All spoke well of him and were amazed. And we think, oh, how lovely. Like giving granny some flowers and she says, oh, how lovely, you know. This is the key. The Greek word, I haven't used a Greek word for a long time. Bear with. The Greek word translated amazed or marveled contains the idea of drawing in and repelling out at the same time. The word is youth amazon. That doesn't matter for now. But it conveys the idea of being awestruck, of being shocked, of being caused to wonder. Okay, but here's the key. It also contains the seeds of beginning to speculate on the matter. Beginning to speculate on the matter. Why is this important? Notice what comes straight after the people being amazed. Comes the question. Wait a cotton-picking minute. Isn't that Joseph's boy? Isn't that Mary's son? We saw him playing in the street when he was this high. Who the Gehenna does he think he is? Speculation was masking their rage just below the surface. Jesus sees it, so he pokes the bear some more, and the bear starts to show its teeth. He launches into a scathing response, and it really is. There's nothing meek and mild about this next section here. Straight after this Isaiah 61 passage has been called out. Why? Because Jesus knows that their speculations are sinister. They carry motives that are hidden. So Jesus cites a proverb, Dr. Heal Yourself. He references Elijah and Elisha's ministry. Not to the Jewish community of believers. No, outside to Gentiles. Astonishing. He's really poking the bear now. That's in verses 25 and 27. What happens after that? Their sinister speculation explodes in rage that Jesus knows is just under the surface. The gospel has exposed their sin. Their murderous sin, by the way. So what they thought was going to be a cuddly bear of predictable synagogue services. Just pop to the synagogue today. Be all right. Be home for dinner. No harm done. Oh, wait a minute. Joseph's son's uh, gone all highfalutin. Got a bit too big for his boots. The Spirit of the Lord's on him. Isn't he Mary's son? And then the rage comes out. When confronted by the Son of God, bringing the truth of the Gospel. Verse 28 in the NIV says, they were furious when they heard these comments. Furious. That word in Greek conveys the idea of much more power and force. It carries the idea of rage. Uncontrollable rage. A personal venting of intense fury. Of the kind of rage that severed the head of a French school teacher on Friday on the streets of Paris. That kind of rage is what Jesus is now dealing with. That's the kind of rage that the Gospel has uncovered. This is the kind of repelling work that the Gospel is doing. So much so that they tried to throw him off the cliff. But just as those fringe disciples in John 6, 66 walked away because of the hard teaching, so here it is Jesus himself who walks away because the crowd refuse his hard teaching. It's quite something. I have a a friend, a companion, who I love to sit in his company and uh, enjoy his work, his books. Uh, I might have mentioned him before. His name is P.T. Forsyth. Anyone? Have I mentioned him once or twice? Barbara's smiling there because you've re- you read him when you were at college. That's great. Do you know, the Spirit of the Lord rested on him so powerfully. I want some of that. Do you know what I mean? I, I want some of that. This is what he said, and this is what I'm going to end with. Nor on this, ready? 
Half gospels have no dignity and no future. Like the famous mule, they have neither pride of ancestry nor hope of posterity. We must make it clear, he says, that Christianity faces the world with terms. It does not just suffuse it with a glow. That it crucifies the world and does not merely consecrate it. That it recreates the world and does not merely soothe or cheer it. That it is life from the dead and not simply bracing for the weak or comfort for the sad. Need to lie down after that one. So what part do you want in this great and eternal gospel manifesto, church? What part do you want? Let us pray. Father, use us for your glory. Put your gospel on our lips. Let your words be fire in our mouths that through us you may ignite the world for Jesus Christ. Lord, you said when you are lifted up, you will draw all people to yourself. Lord, we pray, let the work of the cross continue going to work in our day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Amen.